This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. In Hebrew, like so many other languages, there are clear distinctions between male and female words. And the difference between the words born and begotten can alter your understanding of the resurrection. In one of the most eye-opening teachings he has ever taught, Michael Rood explains why this difference is so critical. Because it's the end of the sixth day, the sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live. Hey, Shabbat Shalom Torah fans, welcome to Shabbat Night Live with Michael Rood. Yes, Michael is teaching again this week. We found material last week that no one has ever seen before and there's more tonight. Heck, there's 10 episodes of this. This is a series he recorded in 2020 that has never been released. Tonight, Michael is teaching about the difference between being born and begotten. There is a difference and it matters when we are trying to understand what happens at the resurrection. Speaking of the resurrection, next week is Passover, and our celebration on Passover is next weekend too, so let's talk about that with my co-host, Ted Clayton. Now this is exciting, Ted. Yes. We've got one week, ladies and gentlemen, until Passover. Tell everybody to get ready. It's gonna be a fantastic event, and Scott, mm -hmm. now, talk to me about Passover just a moment. I know that uh, we can commemorate it, mm -hmm. but, why is our event on the weekend? Well, we have it on the weekend because you know we can't keep Passover anyway. Right. Right. It's just we just we're not in that time period where things are set up where we can literally keep Passover. Right. So we commemorate it. We remember it. Yes, I know that people are celebrating Passover. You know, in the middle of the week next yes. week. Yes. Uh, so you know that's the real Passover. If you're doing a family and friends, we hold our thing on the weekend because you know what we can't keep it anyway. So and most people are off on the weekend. So that's right. Let's celebrate Passover again on the weekend together. So that's why we're doing it this way. And we've got some great uh, guests, ladies and gentlemen. We've got Matthew Vanderells. What a great yes. teacher Matthew Vanderells is. Ladies and gentlemen, we also have uh, Jake Hilton mm -hmm. is gonna be here with us. And he's not only gonna be teaching, but he is going to be celebrating the Passover Seder with us. So yes. that's gonna be fantastic. Also, we've got Avi Lipkin coming yep. directly from the land. Mm -hmm. uh, he'll be with us via satellite here to talk to us about what's going on in the land of Israel. And finally, we've got, like I said, Michael Rood. Michael yes. Rood's gonna be here with us. We're gonna have a great time. Now, if people want to watch this event online, because there's no the seats are sold out, ladies and gentlemen, we're full here at a Root Awakening headquarters. So we can't, we couldn't possibly fit another person in, but you can watch from the comfort of your own home. So Scott, tell us how you do that. Very simple, PassoverCharlotte.com. Uh, it's the same every year, so anytime you wanna find out what's going on with Passover, you can go there, but uh, that's where you get tickets right now to watch online, uh, $79.95. You can watch the whole weekend, you can replay, and also you get 20% off in our store all weekend long, and usually we extend that a little bit too. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'll tell you something else too. You know, uh, this time also is uh, kind of around first fruits as well, right, yes, Scott? So it talk is. to us about first fruits. Uh, real quick, because I know it's it's an important time of giving uh, for people at home and for people here in our studio audience. So talk to us a little bit about first fruits. Yeah, so first fruits, as we know, when Yeshua rose, uh, he had to present the first fruits. That's why he said, Mary, don't touch me. I have not yet ascended to my father. Right. He had to present the first fruits there first, uh, right? And so what is the first fruit? So the first fruits is the first uh, crop of the barley. That's why we do the Omer, or pardon me, that's why we do the Aviv, right? We do the search right. for the Aviv right. because we're estimating in two weeks, will it be ready? Because that first uh, cutting of that crop yes. has to be used for a, uh, a barley loaf uh, offering at the temple. Right. That's why that was done. And, um, you know, so, speaking of which, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of confusion a lot of times, you know, because we had an ADAR bet. Yes. Uh, which means we had a 13th month this year. And the reason was because the barley wasn't Aviv. Well, right. you can't 
make a sacrificial loaf right. if the barley's not aviv to bake it with. Exactly. So uh, we, you know, in the traditional world, uh, Passover was last month, mm -hmm. but we know that because the v barley was not aviv in the land of Israel, we had to push it a month. So that's right. why we're having our commemoration in April instead of yes. having it back in March. Exactly. And you know, this it's one of these things where, you know, things aren't set up anyway to be doing all this officially. Yes. So some people said it was last month, because it was a real, as you remember, it was right on the wire. I oh, mean, yeah. Some people said there's enough barley, some people said there wasn't. And you know what, does it matter? No. And that's always a thing. Yeah. Every year that we look at it is, well, is the barley of Eve? Well, I don't know, let's go over here. Well, it kind of looks of Eve. <laughs> uh, is it really of Eve? Well, I don't know, is it? Because this is barley was grown in the wild and this barley was grown in a cultivated area, you know, which one do we go with? Right. And, uh, you know, there was no official cultivated area right. uh, back in the time of Yeshua. So you have to kind of make these decisions based on the amount of barley that is not a Aviv or is a Aviv. And right. with our scholars here told us that no, it's an Adar bet year, you have to push it. And yeah. uh, so that's why we're celebrating this in April. And honestly, we're all in practice mode anyway. Oh, like sure. I said, nothing is set up. There's no Sanhedrin, no temple, all this kind of stuff. We're all just practicing, trying to keep up these, these uh, commandments and traditions just to sort of keep track and not lose track of Yehovah's yes. calendar. That's all we're trying to do. So if someone celebrated last month, great. You know, I have friends who uh, follow the rabbinic calendar. I say, great. I'll go to your Passover, then you come to mine. Absolutely. It doesn't, you know, come on. Absolutely. Let's, enough Absolutely. of the fighting. Yeah. Well, we have just a little time left. Tell okay. us about the love gift this month. Love gift. Okay, so we're running out of time on the love gift. We got about 10 days left. We got the best translation. This is about uh, getting Hebrew versions of the Revelation to get the best translation of Revelation ever. This is from uh, Miles Jones and Patrick McGuire. This is for your gift of $50 or more. Thank you very much. This is our gift to you. And for a gift of $100 or more, you'll get this and. Rose of Sharon anointing oil with a beautiful crystal bottle. And of course, for 300, we have all of this plus the Omer counters. So we keep this, track of the Omer. This thing is incredible. Yes. I, have, I have seen many different things and many different ways of counting the Omer, but I think this is the most creative way I have ever seen. Yeah, I've never seen something like this. Keeping up with where you are in the Omer. Yeah, lots of fun. And so you've got every day there. And as all, around the dial, you can also see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, because there's seven weeks. And then the 50th day, of course, is uh, Shavuot. You know, Scott, I don't think we say this enough, but we want to thank you. Thank you for uh, help take Shabbat Night Live where it is today and help A Root Awakening the way you do by co-hosting this, uh, this program. Scott, you have been a miracle worker. We appreciate you so much. And I just realized as we were sitting here talking that we haven't said thank you enough. And I just want to be that. And I know Michael, if he were sitting here, would say the same thing. So thank you for holding the mantle for us. Well, I appreciate that, brother. It makes uh, it easy that. when we got Michael Root teaching. That's right, right? it does. <laughs> Here's what you're gonna see, by the way. When the covenant was made and people were under the blood covenant, the Almighty invited the elders of Israel to a marriage supper. On the sapphire blue floor of the throne room of Almighty God, up on the mountain, and that is why we were told to put a fringe of blue, a thread of blue, to hell it, upon the corners of our garments to always remind us that even though we don't see him, we are always in the presence of Almighty God. That's why the blue is to remind us of that. When the elders of Israel went up and ate that meal in the presence of the Almighty, and then God spoke to Moses and said, you come up on the mountain because I am going to give you the tablets of stone on which I have written with my own finger these first 10 statements I shouted down from the mountain. All right, you are going to love this. Episode two of Charting the End with the one and only Michael Rood. It's coming up next, and he does a brilliant job of explaining the difference between born and begotten. It does matter, and you're gonna find out why right after the Kiddush. Not one book of the Bible was written by Greeks. They were all written by Hebrews. So why do we accept that the best and most accurate translations of the New Testament come from the Greek? Don't 
think this is something that's going to tear apart your faith. The story is essentially the same, but there is tweaking that's done in there that has very harmful effect. So we need to seek relationship with the God of truth right. and get back to what was originally said. In the best translation, Dr. Miles Jones and Patrick McGuire reveal a fascinating new methodology to create the most accurate translation of the book of the Revelation ever produced. This month's Love Gift teaching, the best translation, is not available anywhere online, but we'll give it to you as our thanks for supporting A Rude Awakening International. When you donate $50 as a love gift to this ministry in April, you'll get the best translation with Dr. Miles Jones and Patrick McGuire on DVD or Blu-ray. Donate $100 and we'll send you the best translation, plus a Rose of Sharon gift set, featuring a vial of anointing oil and a beautiful crystal bottle. Donate $300 and we'll send you the best translation, the Rose of Sharon crystal bottle set, and a handmade wooden Omer counter to celebrate the countdown to Shavuot. These gifts are a limited time offer from Michael Rood to thank you for your support. Make your donation today and receive the $50 gift, the $100 gift, or the $300 gift. Thank you. Your donations ensure that important teachings like the best translation keep coming from A Rude Awakening International. Use your smartphone to scan the QR code on your screen to donate now and receive these limited time gifts. Or call 888-766-3610. Or get your gifts online with a donation at monthlylovegift.com. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, said that David, King David, was a prophet who saw beforehand the coming of the Messiah. He saw that his son, the Messiah, would be the Kohen Gadol forever after the order of the Melech Zadik. And Yeshua, ordained as the Melech Zadik, as the high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, brought forth bread and wine in Yeshua. On the night in which he was betrayed, brought forth bread and wine and interpreted the very thing that Abraham saw so many generations before. Yeshua took bread and he spoke this blessing. Baruch atah Yehovah elam heinu malak ha'olam. Homotzi lechem min ha'aretz. And he broke the bread and he said, this broken bread represents my broken body, which will be broken for you. By my stripes, you will be healed. Do this in remembrance of me. I'm paying the price. Then he took the wine and he said, Baruch atah Yehovah elahenu melech ha'olam. Barei pari ha'gafen. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, creator of the heavens and the earth and the creator of the fruit of the vine. And he said, this represents the renewed covenant, which will be paid for in my blood. As often as you break this bread and you drink this cup, you exhibit what I've done for you because I am making you priests and kings. I'm paying the price. Shabbat Shalom, priests and kings.
The book of the Revelation was written by John a long time before there was such thing as a book or a codex. It was originally written on parchment, a scroll. It was a letter that was sent to seven congregations in Asia Minor detailing the gospel or the good news of the revealing of Yeshua as a Messiah. It is that order of events that we have put down before you as the revelation scroll, so that you will know the very things that Yeshua said he wants his servants to know about what is going to happen in the last days. The scroll of the revelation begins with the good news of the revealing of Yeshua, the Messiah. And it starts out from John, Yohanan, to the seven congregations in Asia. And it goes on to name those congregations, and then he opens with the salutation. Grace to you, undeserved favor. Grace be to you, and shalom, from he who was, and he who is, and he who is to come. Those words in the Revelation scroll in the British Royal Museum is from Haya Hove Veyavo, he who is, who was and is to come, and the contraction of those three Hebrew words is Yehovah. This is how we remember his name, we remember his nature forever. And so this is grace and shalom from Yehovah, and from the seven spirits before his throne. The seven spirits before his throne, to understand this, we have to go deeper into the book of the Revelation because we, in the book of Revelation, as John is taken to the throne room, he sees the throne of Almighty God, and before him are the seven flaming spirits of God that is before the altar of incense and in front of the sea of fire and glass. To understand what it's like in heaven at this time, we have to go into Yeshua's revealing of these things and understand that these seven flaming spirits before his throne, that was also seen by Moses. And Moses was told to make the menorah, the seven branched lampstand, after the pattern that he saw as he was presented that very image in heaven. He saw the throne of the Almighty. He saw the sea of fire and glass, which is typified as a brazen laver upon the earth. He saw the altar of incense and he saw the brazen altar of sacrifice. He saw all these things and was then told to make it according to this pattern so that there would be a way that we could remember and it would represent the throne room in heaven. This is what it looks like in heaven at this very hour. And so the seven spirits before his throne, that is grace and peace from Yehovah and the seven spirits before his throne, and from Yeshua, Messiah, the faithful witness, the faithful witness, the firstborn from among the dead. Now your King James Version says, the first begotten from among the dead. And this is an excellent opportunity to teach the understanding of this because this understanding of the difference between born and begotten has to be understood if we are going to make any sense of the terminology born again and begotten again as it's used in the Bible. Yeshua is the faithful witness. He is the one that Moses referred to. As Almighty God spoke to Moses and said, there is going to come another prophet after you, Moses, a prophet like you in that he will speak with me directly. He will not speak his own will, he will only speak that which I give him to speak. He will only do that which I tell him to do. And the people are required to shema. They are required to hear and obey. Yeshua is that faithful witness. He is that prophet we must hear and obey. And this is where We have to come back to the understanding and we've got to realize that this is Yeshua's revelation. It's his good news concerning his revealing as a Messiah. 
Most people are more interested in about the revealing of bad things, the revealing of the Antichrist, the revealing of the mark of the beast, who are the 144,000, who, we really need to go right back to the very beginning to understand that Yeshua is that which Moses prophesied. On the day that, that the Almighty shouted down his commandments and, and we as a nation, we spoke to Moses and said, Moses, Moses, we can't stand under this fire like this anymore. We are afraid we're gonna die. You go up and speak to the Almighty and whatever he tells you, you come back and, and tell us. We promise we'll obey. The Almighty told Moses, they well spoken that which they have spoken. I will not speak to them in a flame of fire like this again. I will speak to you and they are required to shema, hear and obey you, but I'm spent sending another one, another faithful witness who will speak only that which I speak. And that is Yeshua. He is that prophet. He is that faithful witness. And he is the first not begotten from the dead, but the firstborn from among the dead. Now, I go to 1 Peter to illustrate this. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord, Yeshua Messiah, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Yeshua Messiah from the dead. Yeshua Messiah was, was raised from the dead and he has begotten us again unto a living hope. Because he was raised from the dead, we have a living hope. That is the seed that is planted within us. That is reality, the spirit of the living God within us that is supposed to be nurtured and is supposed to grow up into the fullness and stature of Messiah. That is where we are, we are begotten again begotten again. Now we go down to verse 23. And it starts out, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. Wait just a minute. We went from begotten again, which is from the male side, seed implanted, to where it is supposed to mature into a, a one new man mature into the, the fullness and stature of Messiah if it's fed correctly, and then it jumps to being born again. And this is the terminology that people use that we are born again. This is the same word as begotten in Greek. It is genao, anathen, genao, anathen. Begotten again, born again, what is the difference? The difference is, in what we understand in English between begotten and born. In Greek, it's the same word. But if it's from the male side, which is begotten again, not born again, but begotten again by incorruptible seed, by the living word of God. Now, begotten again, that implies the seed is implanted. And that is where we are at this point. The seed has been implanted, such as a man impregnates his wife. At that time, at that moment, a child is begotten. But if the father were to die, five minutes later, that child would still be born nine months later. It would be begotten but then it would develop and then the woman would give birth to the child and the child would be brought into this world in a body that is equipped to live in this conscious physical experience that we call life. It's matured to that point. So it is biblically that we are begotten again by incorruptible seed, not like our father, which was corruptible seed, that body is, you know, once it's begotten, it grows in, into a fullness to where it's delivered into the world, it's born, and then it grows and continues to mature until one day it dies. It's corruptible, 
it's going to go the way of all flesh. But Yeshua, in the very first time that he's with one of the elders of Israel, it is on the day of first fruits, in John chapter three, that he's with Nicodemus, and he said, do not marvel that I say unto you, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. You must be born again. Nicodemus acts for some qualification on that. He knew, obviously, you don't enter a second time into his mother's womb. He's asking for a clarification on this. And Yeshua does clarify this. And he further clarifies this to Paul the apostle, in which flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. You must be born again. There is a resurrection. There are several resurrections. One, it says that the, the, everyone will be made alive in their own order. Messiah, comma, the first fruits, comma, then those who are Messiahs at his coming, comma, then the end, the end resurrection, which we see at the end of the book of the Revelation. After the millennial reign, where Yeshua reigns and rules on earth for a thousand years, then the second resurrection, the last resurrection, or as it is the end resurrection, when everyone who has ever lived, whether they wanna get up or not, are gonna be raised, they're gonna be brought before the throne of Yeshua, and he will be the judge. This is what he said was going to happen, and this is our living hope. We've been begotten again by the Spirit of God. We are supposed to grow up in the fullness and stature of maturity, the fullness and stature of Messiah. And then we know that this corruptible seed that we are begotten of the first time is going to finally end up in the grave. And then, because Yeshua was raised from the dead, as it says, that because God has raised Yeshua from the dead, we have this living hope within us that we have been begotten again and one day we will be born again. When Yeshua returns from heaven and raises the dead at the first resurrection of those who are in the Messiah, who will then be gathered together at the last trump to the sea of fire and glass, there to be judged according to the reward of what we've done in the flesh. Yeshua is the faithful witness. He is the one of whom Moses spoke, the one that the Almighty promised, that he will speak directly from heaven and everyone is required to Shema, that prophet. And if they don't, they will be judged. And that judgment we find in the book of the Revelation is eternal judgment. It doesn't, specify that in, in the book of Deuteronomy. It just says, diligent inquiry will be made and they will be judged accordingly. But on the day of Pentecost, Peter said, those who do not hear and obey, they will be destroyed. We see at the end of the book of the Revelation, Yeshua lays this all out. The very revelation that he gave Peter and allowing Peter to be the first one to declare to the nation of Israel that Yeshua, the prophet, the faithful witness, is also the Messiah. He, God has made him both Lord and Messiah. And so, he is the faithful witness, and he is the firstborn from among the dead. He has a body that, as Yeshua said, touch me, a spirit doesn't have flesh and bone. The life of the flesh is in the blood in our first incarnation, when we are begotten of corruptible seed by our Father. The first time we are here in the flesh, it is powered by blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. But Yeshua, his blood was poured out for us. And what now energizes him is not flesh and blood. It's not blood. Flesh and bone a spirit doesn't have, but the spirit within him, this is in his transformed body, and we're going to see, just 60 years after the resurrection, we're gonna see what his body looks like. Now, it continues. Glory, 
and honor and an everlasting dominion be unto Yeshua Messiah. A direct quote from the book of Daniel. And this is Yeshua to whom we owe all glory and honor and an everlasting dominion will be his. He is the ruler over all the kings of the earth. He is the one who loved us and washed us by his own blood and he made us kings and priests unto Yehovah his father. Now what is this talking about, making us priests and kings unto Yehovah his father? What is this that he loved us and washed us by his own blood? What does this mean? In order to understand these two sentences, we have to have an understanding of what happened at Mount Sinai. In the book of Exodus, we are brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand. We are brought to the base of Mount Sinai and it says that it was the third month in which we left Israel. In the very day, it was the Rosh Kodesh of the third month. It was the first day of the first month. The first sliver of the new moon was sighted when we got to Mount Sinai and we camped at the base of Mount Sinai. And it says that Israel encamped before the mount in verse two of chapter 19. And Moses went up to God and Yehovah called to him out of the mountain. And he said, now this is the same mountain where Moses had met the Almighty in a burning bush that commanded him to go back and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt and to bring them back to this mountain to worship him on that mountain. This is a nation that he's going to call to be his priest to the entire world. As the scripture says, that he divided the nations at the Tower of Babel. He divided and scattered the nations according to the number of the sons of Israel, who are not going to be born for hundreds of years. But he scattered Nimrod's one world government system, his Novus Ordo Seclorum, he scattered these people when their tongues and confused them in their pagan sun god worship and scattered them all over the face of the earth because he was going to choose a people to represent him who would reconcile the world back to the one true God. And now Moses goes up into the mountain and reports back as he was ordered back to the Almighty. And when he goes up into the mountain, then Yehovah called to him and said, this is what you were going to say to the house of Jacob. Tell the children of Israel, you have seen what I did to Pharaoh. You have seen that I bear you out of Egypt on eagle's wings and I brought you out to myself. You have seen that I destroyed Pharaoh and his chariots and army in the bottom of the Red Sea. You have seen the miracles that I did. Now, will you keep my commandments? If you will obey my voice, if you will keep my covenant, you will be my segula, my, my treasure that's so precious. A treasure that a segula is that precious treasure that a king will allow no one to touch. He holds it in his hands alone. He protects it and he doesn't entrust it to anyone else. You will be my segula, my peculiar people, and you will be unto me a people above all people. And you will be a nation of priests and kings, a nation of priests and kings, if you will keep my commandments. Speak this to the children of Israel. So Moses came down the mountain and declared all these words to the people. We had no idea what his commandments were going to be, but we did know that he was our savior. 
He saved us. Now he's asking us, will we make him Lord? Will we do what he says to do? He was our savior. We don't have to confess him as savior. We don't have to accept him as savior. He saved us, that's a fact. He paid the price and he brought us out. Now, he's saying, will you keep my commandments? If you will, you will be a kingdom of priests. You'll be my prophets, my representatives to the entire world. The opening salutation in the book of the Revelation says glory and honor and an everlasting dominion be unto Yeshua, who loved us and washed us by his own blood and who made us kings and priests unto Yehovah his Father. Now what does the book of Exodus have to do with that statement? It has everything to do with that statement because it was at Mount Sinai that Moses came down with a message from the Almighty to the children of Israel and said, you have seen that I was your savior. I brought you out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Now I'm bringing you to this mountain and I'm offering to make a covenant with you. And if you will keep my commandments, keep this covenant, I will make you a nation of priests and kings. You will be my representatives to the entire world. You will be my segula. You will be a a precious treasure that I will allow no one to touch. And the people said, all that Yehovah says, we promise we'll obey. Moses returned the words of the people to Yehovah. And up on the mountain, the Almighty said, I am going to come down. After the people have sanctified themselves, set aside and for three days, and then I am going to come down in their presence, I'm going to reveal myself to them, and I'm going to do something so powerful in that day that they will never doubt your words again, Moses. They will know that you are speaking for me. And so, after the preparations, in three days, 
Now we come to, according to the calendar, to the time that would become Shavuot, a feast of Yehovah in the future. And that is the day that trumpets began blowing from the top of a mountain that had been cordoned off. No one, no person, and no animal was allowed to go up on that mountain, and if they even stepped out onto that mountain, there were boundary markers that showed people and animals being shot through with arrows. It was a warning sign, do not encroach upon this mountain. And then, the morning of the third day, as the trumpets began to blow, then the rocks began to break, and a fire, a furnace of fire came down upon that mountain as the mountain shook, and everyone a mile away in the camp was being led by Moses to the base of that fiery mountain, and we were shaking every step of the way. When we got to the base of the mountain, the trumpet stopped, and then Moses called out to Yehovah, and Moses then was called up to the mountain. Yehovah spoke out, Moses, Moses, come up here. And Moses walked right up into the middle of, the, of that blast furnace. That was so powerful that no one in Israel ever doubted his word again. They knew that he was tight with the Almighty. Moses was then instructed to bring the people up closer and so they came up closer. And then Yehovah shouted down his 10 commandments. Now, I know that you have watched movies that have tried to portray this, but nothing could even come close to this. The people said as when the 10th commandment was finally shouted down, the people cried out to Moses, Moses, we are afraid we're gonna die. Stop this. Don't have the Almighty speak to us in this way uh, anymore. You, if you will go up and speak with him, we know that you're tight with him. We saw you walk up into the middle of that blast furnace and come back down. We heard him call you by name. If you'll go up there and speak to him, Whatever he tells you, you come down and tell us, we promise we'll obey. So Moses went up into that blast furnace. He walked up there, and the Almighty spoke to him face to face. And Moses told him, the people don't want you to speak to them in all your power and glory like this. Just speak to me, and they will promise to obey. And the Almighty said, they have well spoken that which they have spoken. Moses records the whole interaction between himself and the Almighty and what transpired on that day. And the Almighty said, I will speak to you, Moses, and you will then communicate my word and my will, my instructions to my people. And the people are required. They're required to hear and obey you. But I know that they're going to add commandments, they're gonna subtract commandments, they're gonna do exactly what I'm, I, I'm gonna command you. And I'm going to tell you that no one is ever allowed to add one single commandment to the commandments I give you. No one is allowed to diminish one single commandment so that they may keep all the commandments of Yehovah their God. If anyone is allowed to add to or subtract from, we no longer have the commandments of God. We have the beginning of a man-made religious system where they can pick and choose. They can pick commandments that they like or they can diminish them. They can add more commandments that they want to control, manipulate, and intimidate the people and get them to follow their own things. But no, no one is ever allowed to add or subtract that's the foundational commandment that I'm giving you, Moses, and I'm repeating it twice so that no one can make a mistake. It is to be read to them every seven years of their life, minimally, that no one adds and no one subtracts. And then the Almighty said to Moses, I am going to send another prophet in the future a prophet like unto you, Moses, a prophet that hears directly from me, face to face. 
He will not speak his own commandments. He will not speak anything and not do anything except I command him to do so. And if that prophet speaks presumptuously or steps out of line in any way, that prophet will die. That prophet that I send to communicate my words right from the throne room, if he acts on behest of anyone else, anything else, any other God, if he responds in any way to anyone except for me, that prophet will die. So then Moses said that the Almighty gave continued commandments. Six pages in your King James Version of the Bible, but the commandments that the Almighty gave him on top of the mountain starting with when you make an altar and want to do a thanksgiving offering to me, make sure that you make it of unhewn stone. I don't want a tool lifted up upon this. I don't want this to be something of your own making. If you want to give thanks to me, then you can do an altar of unhewn stone. Then he goes on to explain men stealing and indentured service so that the children of Israel can understand just what the Almighty says and is later reiterated by Yeshua. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the Torah and the prophets. The first four commandments shouted down from the mountain is how we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. The last six are how we love our neighbor as ourself. Moses continued on with those in indentured servitude. What happens if someone has to sell themselves into servitude because they've gone bad on a debt, they've gone bankrupt, and they need to make up for, uh, for uh, a mistake that they made? How is this handled? How is this done? as opposed to men stealing, which m much of the world has been involved in, actually stealing people and selling people, completely against the commandments of Almighty God. Moses receives the additional commandments and he comes down the mountain and then he writes them on a scroll of parchment. Then he has a Levite sacrifice Bullock and to then take the blood, the gallons of blood into basins into which Moses dipped hyssop branches, and then he shook the blood-covered hyssop branches upon the children of Israel. All afternoon it would have taken two and a half million people, the men, the women, the children, the blood was shaken upon them. Then the blood was shaken upon the scroll that Moses just wrote. Those, that small scroll, just six pages in your English version of the Bible. And then he shook it upon the altar of unhewn stone. And he said, this is the blood covenant. Ladies and gentlemen, to understand the revelation, how Yeshua could wash us by his own blood, and make us priests and kings, we have to understand that we were under a blood covenant, which means whoever breaks the covenant is as dead as the bull whose blood you were sprinkled with. If Almighty God breaks his covenant, then he dies. If Israel breaks the covenant with God, they die. There's no way out, that is it. That's why the scripture says we are to speak our oaths and to use this formula, as Yehovah lives, because Yehovah will never break his covenant. And so we are to say, as Yehovah lives, as Almighty God lives, we will do our best and we will keep this contract, this covenant, as Yehovah lives. It's not to be entered into lightly. And so then, when the covenant was made, and people were under the blood covenant, the Almighty invited the elders of Israel to a marriage supper. On the sapphire blue floor of the throne room of Almighty God, up on the mountain, and that is why we were told to put a fringe of blue, a thread of blue, to hell it, 
upon the corners of our garments to always remind us that even though we don't see him, we are always in the presence of Almighty God. That's why the blue is to remind us of that. When the elders of Israel went up and ate that meal in the presence of the Almighty. And then God spoke to Moses and said, you come up in the mountain because I am going to give you the tablets of stone on which I have written with my own finger these first 10 statements I shouted down from the mountain because I never want my people to ever forget this momentous event in which I shouted down the commandments and they were so afraid, they said, we don't wanna hear it anymore, we are afraid we're gonna die, I'm going to write it in stone and I want you to come up into the mountain and I'm gonna give you those commandments on tablets of stone. Moses went up into the mountain. For 40 days and 40 nights he fasted. The Almighty gave him the revelation concerning a tabernacle, a tabernacle that he wanted to build for the congregation of Israel in which he would dwell among his people. He gave him first the detail concerning what was going to go in the tabernacle, which is the Ark of the Covenant, which is representative of the throne of Almighty God upon the earth. It was according to the pattern, but not exactly what was seen in heaven because we see in the book of the Revelation that around the throne of Almighty God, there are four living creatures with four faces, with six wings covering their body, and covering the six wings are eyes, living eyes that see everything and know everything in a glance. Nothing gets past them. And when they shout holy, it can only be typified by writing the word three times because when they shout holy, the entire universe shakes. But upon the earth, it wasn't four living creatures. It was two, their own, two men with wings that covered two cherub, cherubim, that wings covered them. And the Ark of the Covenant that he was given the description of, but not yet told what was going to go in it. Then Moses was given all of the details concerning the articles of furniture for the tabernacle. And then finally, Moses is given a reiteration of the sanctity of the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day that God put in place at, at creation. He rested on the seventh day, the Sabbath day, and, and he said, remember this, guard it, shomer it, and keep it holy. And then he gave Moses tables of stone, these tablets, and upon these tablets with the finger of God was written the first 10 commandments that was shouted down from the mountain. Moses came down from the mountain, and as he came down, what had the Israelites done? On the altar of unhewn stone, they had carved, they had chiseled, the petroglyphs, the imprints of the cow and bull gods, Apis and Hathor. On top of that altar was a golden calf that was fashioned by Aaron. And Aaron said, tomorrow is a feast to Yehovah. Moses came down from the mountain and the Almighty said, Moses, stand back, I'm gonna kill them all. I'm gonna kill them all and I'm gonna start over with you. They have broken the first commandment. You shall have no other gods in my face. I said in the continued commandments, do not learn the way of the heathen. Do not learn how they worship or serve their gods and do the same thing unto me. It is an abomination. It is utterly disgusting, putrid and vile, and yet they have done that very thing. I will start over with you and your family, but I'm gonna kill them all, stand back. And Moses said no. You're not going to start over with me. Moses went back up into the mountain for another 40 days and 40 nights and pled with the Almighty. He interceded, stood in the way of Almighty God in Israel in bringing to pass the repercussions, the death penalty for breaking the blood covenant. And Moses said, you're gonna have to figure something else out. And he did. God Almighty figured something else out because Moses would not go along 
with plan A. Because plan A was they broke the covenant, they're going to die. I'm gonna kill them now. I'll start over right now with you. And so the Almighty figured out something else. He said, Moses, three times a year, all of the nation of Israel, every male is going to come up to the feast. The feast in the place where I shall put my name. And the place where I shall put my name is where the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark which is called by my name, wherever it is, that's where they're gonna go, that's where they're going to keep the feast, and they're gonna sacrifice bulls and goats and lambs and rams on a brazen altar year after year, century after century, millennia after millennia. They are going to be constantly reminded that they owe the death penalty. That's what the sacrifices are all about, to remind them that they owe the death penalty, but bulls and goats and lambs and rams, their blood cannot pay the death penalty. It can only be paid by the death of the offending party. Unless someone who never breaks the covenant volunteers to die in the place of the guilty party. One who loves Israel so much, he's willing to give his own life and shed his own blood. He who knows no sin can volunteer to die in the place of the guilty party. And because his love compels him to do so, he then voluntarily washes us by his own blood. And that which we were offered to be priests and kings, he then can renew that covenant and make us priests and kings unto Jehovah, his Father. Shalom, Torah fans. Give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend. Tap the subscription button and the bell icon, and I promise to update weekly with in-depth biblical research. Be sure to download the new michaelrood.tv app for both mobile and home devices for even more commercial-free content.